before we get to the details of the portfolio, are we anywhere near some kind of completely stable scenario in the Middle East here? Um, no, I have to admit we aren't. Uh, yeah. As we mentioned a couple of times, I thought we were much closer to a truce. I still believe we're moving in that direction, but but Netanyahu seems hell bent on destroying what was whatever's left of Hamas, whatever he can do. And um, whenever he's done with that, the one thing he will have destroyed is his will support in the West. Um, the Palestinians are uh, <clears throat> growing their support in the West as well as within the Middle East. Uh, the Israelis are losing support left, right and center, and that will create a more unstable environment over the coming years because the Palestinian question is back in Middle Eastern politics. Uh, mm. it, it's It's been... F- You're listening to Macro Sunday, hosted by Andreas Steno. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Macro Sunday podcast. I'm Andreas Steno, the founder and CEO of Steno Research. And uh, as per usual, I'm joined by you, my co-host, Mikkel Rosenbaum, head of geopolitics here at Steno Research. Good to see you. Good to see you. Mikkel, um, quite a week. Um, Absolutely. In commodity space, in minor space, uh, oh. the FOMO is... Absolutely thriving out there, uh, even in my body, to be honest. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, loads is. of stuff to talk about. It is. We'll get back to the uh, actual trades we've mm. done late in the in the show, the actionable part. We mm. we, sk- we skip for the part for the late, uh, for the last parts of of the show. Uh, before we get started with the um, with the content of today and the interview we have with Bob, mm-hmm. Bob Elliott, let's just remind that we are uh, you can get a full access to our uh, coverage and analysis on stenoresearch.com. You can sign up for a free 14-day trial or sign up for our free newsletter, which is very popular these days. Yeah. So go check that out. A lot of free content. Some not free. That's how it is. The most important stuff is not free. That's yeah. uh, that's I guess the most important thing to mention. <laughs> Absolutely, but this podcast is, yeah. podcast is free. So for now, I can ask you anything and get some yeah. good good advice for you. And Andreas, I want to ask you. You like to be the contrarian sometimes. We're in a cyclical upswing, are we not? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've been banging the drum on the cyclical upswing since the autumn, basically. Yeah. Um, I saw some of these underlying dynamics pointing to a recovery in manufacturing, pointing to a recovery in stuff related to the production of commodities. Uh, and it is slowly but surely, <laughs> not so slowly anymore actually, <laughs> playing out now. Mm. Um, we've got these easier financial conditions in the US. We're starting to see easier financial conditions outside of the US, leading to this optimism around the cycle again. Let me just remind you that um, In 2023, we were stuck in a discussion, an ongoing discussion, basically, on whether the U.S. was about to enter a recession because of a weak manufacturing cycle. And now we're seeing the exact opposite. Everyone concluding the economy is healing and it's healing fast because the manufacturing sector is doing a little better. Mm. Who cares about the manufacturing sector anymore? Um, apparently markets do, uh, and that's why we're so focused on it in this show. But it's not a meaningful part of the U.S. economy. Um, and you could, of course, argue that we're amidst the wall economy and the manufacturing construction pays and all of that will keep the economy uh, alive. Uh, let's just have a look at the numbers. I mean, manufacturing is worth less nowadays even substantially less than 20% of the economy. It's the 80% of the economy that matters for that this recession call. Mm. So my point here is just, yes, we are seeing a reacceleration in, in some of these commodity-linked uh, sectors. We are seeing a reacceleration in cyclical parts of the manufacturing space. But it does not necessarily mean that the U.S. is out of the woods. We'll get a, a little bit back to the rest of the world as well and your view on that. But, but let's just talk a little bit about commodities. We're getting a lot of questions on that. It seems mm. like commodities are lifting off, left, right, and center right now. <laughs> uh, how do you jump on the train? Do you jump on the train? Um, it kind of depends on on your risk appetite here because I tend to look at this as um, a complete meld-up um, because of that change of scenery from uh, a very uniform negative 
sentiment around commodities and manufacturing to now everyone all of a sudden having to turn around completely on that view at the same time. Um, so in full transparency, we are riding the wave, but we were early in catching these trends, meaning that we have a great profit to lean on uh, when we're long this trade. Uh, I don't think the risk reward is as attractive as it was two or three months ago, joining this reflation train. Um, when we look at our asset allocation tool, uh, we now cast three main parameters for the US economy, um, liquidity, inflation, and manufacturing growth. Uh, we have a change of scenery in April um, compared to this almost gung-ho, risk-on, reflation-style market we had over the past two quarters. Um, it is still a reflationary environment because inflation is still spiraling up. Uh, manufacturing is rebounding, but liquidity is turning, um, meaning that you have to be a little bit more selective and a little bit more careful in how you jump this train compared to a few months ago. Um, the asset allocation tool is extremely upbeat on silver. Uh, I know this is almost a consensus view now, um, but I think there's a final leg in this. Uh, but we're not talking quarters after quarters from here, probably. No. You already teased a little bit there about uh, some of the traits we'll yeah. be talking about later. Fair enough. Um, before we get to the interview, let, let, let's talk a little bit about Europe as well. Uh, yeah. The last episode we recorded just before Easter, we had over the Easter period some some inflation prints out of Germany. Uh, has Europe managed the inflation crisis? Are we at uh, uh, at target levels? Will, will that keep on? What, what's your view on that? Um, well, yes, we're at target. Uh, probably even below mm -hmm. if you look at the most recent trends. Um, bear in mind that this soft inflation print from Europe, uh, which was, by the way, smack dab at some of our now costs, was impacted by the early timing of the Easter. Mm -hmm. um, so the Easter um, period was basically right through the end of March. Uh, and we know that stuff like flight tickets, hotels, uh, restaurant services, all that stuff is impacted by such an event. This basically means that April will be likely be very, very soft because you'll get a retracement of some of these price increases in service categories uh, into April. Um, and when you compare that to last year, uh, I guess we will be below target on annual inflation by the release of that print. So I'm not ruling out that some of the ECB members will actually try and tee up the discussion on a rate cut in April, uh, given this. Um, and we saw how the uh, Swiss National Bank surprised everyone with an early rate cut last month. So why not? Um, I, I lean that way. If, if anything, I think Europe is the right place to be in if you want to receive interest rates slash buy fixed income uh, with a uh, medium-term duration profile. While the curve seems to reflate in the US um, more or less on a structural trend basis here. But Miguel, um Obviously, this commodity landscape, um, the developments in oil, which are pretty impressive right now uh, from a return perspective, they're also linked to what's ongoing in the Middle East. Um, and I think it's hard to argue that the Israel-Gaza war really moved the needle a lot for oil, but it moved it a little bit maybe. Yeah. Um, but what about Israel targeting other countries? Um, it's been talk of the town geopolitically whether... Israel could be on the verge of a conflict that is much more broad scaled, mm. um, in particular against Iran, I guess. I'm still skeptical of that. Yeah. Um, but a couple of days ago, we saw the Israeli attack uh, the Iranian uh, embassy in Damascus in mm. Syria, which which is a very significant attack. Uh, and so we're, we're at the moment of recording uh, on, on on Thursday afternoon. We're still waiting for the Iranian response. I, I, I expect it will follow the usual... Iranian recipe for that, which is to to do reciprocal attack, a tit for tat uh, response, basically. Uh, <clears throat> so you'll have to look at geography. Israel hit Iran outside of Iran; it was inside Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, so Iran's response will likely be outside of Israel, or at least outside of the main cities. 
you look at the uh, the target type. This was not a directly uh, directed at a military f- facility. It was, however, directed at some military officers. So Iran could try to replicate that by striking some command posts or, or, or similar on the border towards uh, Lebanon or in Gaza. And finally, the importance of, of this target. Um, this wasn't some some proxy group or anything. This was an, an official Iranian embassy, and, and and that carries some importance. So I expect Iran Iran to to respond, but I expect them to uh, respond in an eye for an eye matter, um, a manner. Um, and thus, if Israel does not want to ex- escalate this conflict any further, they can leave it at that. That's what we saw Iran do when 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 the U.S. struck, uh, when the U.S. was struck. Um, we had tit for tat attacks. They had an exchange of missiles with Pakistan uh, earlier this year. They have managed to settle that. So the language to speak to Iran in this is that it's, it's an eye for an eye. So so Israel carry out, carries out an attack. They will ex- uh, expect a response. And if, if that response is uh, of the same magnitude, i think they they will be able to leave it at that because right now Israel definitely did, don't need any more enemies. Yep. They're they're running out of friends actually. So um, so so that's the outview, uh, outlook. I'm I'm still not looking. Uh, uh, I still don't believe we're looking at a, at a at a broader Middle Eastern war. Not at all. On the other hand, you you have to uh, acknowledge that that Iran is not running these groups like like puppet uh, like Houthis and the Hezbollah and Hamas. They're not running them as puppet dolls as some would have you believe. They have influence over these groups, but 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 they're very much autonomous. So a lot can still happen down there. Um, the pressure within Israel is growing for a peace deal. Uh, we're hearing coalition partners of, of Netanyahu and other political parties calling for elections uh, uh, during the year. So so time is running out for Netanyahu, but he, he still has a lot more damage to do, I, th- I think he, he thinks himself. Yeah, Miguel. And um, <laughs> I think this is a good opportunity to introduce Bob Elliott, not because Bob is a geopolitical expert, but because we always introduce Bob Elliott, Ray Dalio's former right-hand guy at Bridgewater, um, with the song from Outcast called Bombs Over Baghdad. So here's Bob Elliott after the song. One, two, one, two, three. Yeah, it's national underground thunder pounds when I stop the ground. Like a million elephants and silverback orangutans, you can't stop the train. Who wants up? Don't come unprepared. I'll be there, but when I leave there, better be a household name. Brother man telling us it ain't gonna rain. So now we It's now my great pleasure to introduce Bob Elliott, the founder and CIO of Unlimited Funds to the Macro Sunday podcast again. Bob, always great to see you. Andreas, great to see you. Bob, um, before we went on air here, we talked about the mood in the room right now. It seems like everyone is all of a sudden so optimistic around the future. What on earth is going on and what has happened over the past couple of quarters to make people turn around on their views like this? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen is that the durability of the expansion, particularly in the U.S. economic context, but also to some extent in in Europe, has been um, a bit stronger, a bit longer than than folks expected. There's a lot of positioning, I think, that came in you know, on the back of the market action that happened uh, at the at the end of last year, where, you know, when you saw that bond rally, I mean, what typically drives a bond rally is uh, deteriorating growth conditions. And um, <clears throat> the thing that's confusing about that, you know, so people expected, you know, many people expected that to continue and economists and, and other managers were sort of keying off that. Um, but I think they got the linkage wrong, which is that we had an easing dynamic which helped support asset prices, which was a short-term support to economic activity, creating a modest reacceleration. But the problem is, you know, and that's why, you know, stocks have outperformed bonds over the course of the last, you know, three or four months. But the problem is now the consensus expectations has totally changed. We went from expectations of below 1% U.S. growth in 2024 to now penciling out, you know, between two and two and a half percent growth, which is basically to say that the strong growth we're seeing here in the first quarter is going to continue basically for the whole year at a time when basically bond yields have risen 60 basis points. That seems less probable uh, than expected. Mm. But Bob, if we look at consensus expectations outside of the U.S., it still seems like this is a very U.S.-centric rebound story, right? Um, Do you get the same vibes of reflation outside of the U.S.? 
Yeah, it's, it's a good point. And certainly the consensus expectations have been lagging outside the U.S. Uh, relative to the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is really the outlier when it comes to uh, expected increases in, in growth. Um, I, you know, the, the, um, the economies outside the U.S., I mean, particularly if I look at sort of Europe and, and the U.K., they're not, you know, those economies certainly aren't strong and no one's arguing that, but they're not a disaster. And I think in a lot of ways, people looked at those economies, if you go back a year or two ago, a year ago, like they thought that the interest rate tightening that occurred was going to drive a significant slowing in those economies. And that's not really happening. They're just kind of putzing along kind of, you know, fine, not great. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's nothing particularly extreme. And I think that connects to the ECB story. Um, which is that on the ECB side, um, and also a little bit on the Bank of England side, uh, you know, inflation has come down sufficiently, basically, where they can, you know, in a straight face way, say, we're basically at what our target is, maybe, you know, or, or we're going to see our target soon. Mm. Um, you were very ahead of that in terms of uh, picking up on the disinflationary pressures in Europe in particular. I think the problem is, from a monetary policy standpoint, if you're trading that, the urgency to move is often driven by deteriorating growth conditions. And so that's one of the challenges with that trade right now, which is like the ECB could say, hey, look, we're basically back to where we're supposed to be, but you know, growth isn't particularly bad. And so we're not gonna rapidly cut. We might transition to cuts, but we might not rapidly cut or or cut nearly as rapidly as priced into say, you know, the the curve, you know, the short rate curve in Europe. Speaking of interest rate expectations. Given this ongoing reflation in the U.S. economy, uh, given this ongoing repricing of expectations for growth in 2024, where does that leave these three cuts in the dot plot from the Federal Reserve? Uh, I mean, do you think they will actually cut into this? I, you know, it's 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 a good question. I I think um, when we started the year, I the first thing I woke up January 1st and I and I wrote a tweet that was basically like, look, if growth is at or above potential. And inflation is still a little too high and unemployment rates at secular lows, like, why would you do anything? Right. And I think that the spirit of and that was a time when people thought that they were going to cut like in March mm. for the first cut. And we've moved past that. Um, you know, the idea that uh, the economic expansion is sort of good enough to not create urgency to cut. Plus, I think some of those inflationary pressures um, are maybe not long-term emerging, but certainly cyclically, we're likely, you know, in a, in a short-term basis in the U.S. context, starting to see some upward pressure on inflation. We've got a couple months of, of like, not good data, not bad data, but not uh, adding confidence the way Chairman Powell is looking for. And now we've got, you know, gas prices are moving up a buck from having fallen a buck. And that, you know, that has an effect that'll flow through to other prices. And so inflation is likely to be just a bit above what they were projecting out or expecting. And so you put that together, and I think we could easily see a circumstance where um, at least, you know, for the next three or six months, there's just nothing, there's not enough confidence to shift towards the cut cycle, um, given, you know, the the overall uh, economic environment. And so that's why I think if you get to the end of the year, we may well have a situation where the short rate cuts expected don't come. The long rate is moving up for a variety of reasons, but growth is starting to slow because of the effects of those dynamics, right? The rise in rates is starting to affect the economy and asset prices, particularly relative to the elevated expectations. Mm -hmm. In the context of these predicted cuts from the Federal Reserve, we've seen a tremendous rally uh, in precious metals. We've even seen silver joining the party now uh, over the past couple of weeks here. So, Bob, how do you link precious metals and the cutting cycle? Uh, are those two themes that go hand in hand? Well, I think it's, it's very interesting that we've seen precious metals, uh, gold in particular, push to new highs during a period of time where U.S. rates are rising and expected cuts are being priced out. That's typically not the way the relationship works because, you know, gold is non-interest bearing money. And typically when interest rates rise, gold falls because it doesn't bear any interest. I think um, the story there is much more about what's happening in the East rather than what's happening in the West, where downward pressure on uh, on the yuan in particular is creating domestic demand for gold. We're seeing 
um, we're seeing significant uh, demand sort of through proxy ways like uh, domestic gold ETFs trading at 30% premiums, which is not a normal thing, the Shanghai premium, uh, relatively elevated, all of those things are happening. And I think that's what's driving the gold price action. Because when you look in the West, actually, like GLD, which is a good indication of the GLD ETF, which is a good indication of, you know, retail and institutional demand for gold, because if it's easy, it's an efficient way to hold it. They're still selling shares. There's still a net negative flow into GLD at a time when the gold price is surging. And so it really is that story uh, in the Far East and about the currency policy and pressures that exist in China much more so than it is about what's going on with the Fed. So if we look at the domestic positioning in the U.S. in precious metals, how do you actually gauge the current positioning? Is it underweight precious metals given <laughs> even with the price action that we've seen? Yeah, I mean, if you, if I think the sentiment, uh, Western investor sentiment, I think is well tracked with that, uh, with looking at the flows into and out of the GLD ETF. It obviously doesn't cover the whole market and there's other things going on, the futures positioning and things like that. Um, but it's become sort of a ubiquitous way in which basically everyone expresses a view on gold in the US. And so um, I think what we're seeing there, I mean, we've seen two years of sales of, of gold positions in GLD as gold prices have risen. Uh, and I think, you know, that is setting up likely, that's setting up a risk for a short squeeze. I mean, this is sort of a, a very classic way in which uh, these sort of short squeeze dynamics emerge, which is, you know, you're underweight, you're selling, and then all of a sudden the price squeezes for some reason unrelated to, you know, the previous positioning. And then even moving from selling to neutral in terms of the flows could create a further exacerbation of the price pressures upwards. And so that's kind of the dynamic that I see emerging in the gold market is that sort of Western short squeeze, you know, demand driven by China creating a Western short squeeze, which is starting to put pressure on, you know, further pressure on the price upward. Yeah. Uh, we've just bought into the silver miners uh, space over the past week here, which I guess is the uh, absolute ultimate FOMO trade in this space. Uh, but uh, I mean, the sentiment seems to be shifting also domestically um, in in the US, uh, but also across the West uh, in relation to these precious metals, despite this, this outflow. So it'd be very interesting to see how the flows evolve over the next couple of months here. Bob, I want to talk to you about uh, the curvature of the dollar curve. Uh, into the summer here as well, because currently we're seeing reflation across the board in commodities. Uh, it seems like we've sort of broken a bearish trend in commodities from the past couple of quarters, uh, and inflation expectations have risen over the past uh, three, four months. So if the Federal Reserve decides to either cut or stay on hold into such a scenario, how will the yield curve trade from here? Uh, I, you know, I think the, the the question is basically um, what's the likely path of uh, monetary policy, and then also what are the pressures on the long end. Mm. And so, I think when you look at those two things, look, we're in, in the U.S. case. Let's just go through December twenty four. You know, where are we at? We're at basically two cuts at this point, give or take. Uh, you know, the day's pricing. Um, you know, there's not a lot of juice there. Like, how much is that really going to change? You know, maybe it's one one cut gets realized. Maybe zero cuts get realized. You know, that's better that the, you know, that is, that is a trade and, but it's a lot different trade than when seven cuts were priced in <laughs> and the economy was strong, right? Like that, that we've, we've all the easy money in that trade has basically been made. And so now we're nitpicking, is it June or, you know, or September or, or you know, later than that, that's really what we're doing there. I think the more interesting thing, so that's kind of anchored and the Fed is probably not going to meaningfully go, they're not going to probabilistically, they're not going to tighten meaningfully at this point, given the totality of the picture. So that's kind of the short end, I feel, is very anchored where it is right now. I think the real interesting stuff that's going on is out there on the long end, where, um, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about the supply issues. You know, it's not the only thing that's going on. It is an influence. We're moving from a first quarter and a fourth quarter to a second quarter where there's going to be a 50% rise in net duration issuance. You know, that will have an effect that is that needs to be bought by investors right now. It's being meaningfully bought by uh, long only asset managers who are extending their duration and being shied away from by hedge funds, banks, dealers, etc. 
And so the question is, how, how much extension of duration are they able to continue? And really, what is that based on? I think if you listen to the, the, the market press, you know, the interviews of long only bond managers, all of them say, hey, look, interest rates are going back to two and a half percent. So I look at a 440 bond yield and I'm like, that's a great deal. And the question is, is that really where we're going? Is that really the neutral rate? I think there's a lot of reasons to believe it's not that. Mm. It's higher than that, both in the short term and in the long term. And so if that's the case, those bonds that look good, cheap at 440 may not look that way in the context of substantial supply and a re-rating of what the long-term neutral interest rate is. Mm. I think over the past week, Bank of International Settlements basically killed the R star as a concept <laughs> uh, in in a paper. They they basically wrote that no one has a clue uh, where R star is um, on a daily basis. But when you uh, look at fixed income markets, also given your experience from hedge funds, from unlimited funds, do you try and assess this R star on a running basis? Or how do you view this long-term neutral rate concept from a tradable perspective? Yeah, well, I, I think um, <clears throat> I think it's more efficient. R star, like who the heck knows? Yeah. Put seven economists in a room, get seven highly uh, optimized econometric models that are now saying something totally different. Like who the heck knows, you know? Um, so I, I think R star itself is not that interesting. Other than to say, I think on the short end, there's a lot better sense as to what's going on. In, in the sense of you can you can understand whether money is tight or easy by what's going on with economic conditions and economic and you know we've had interest rates on the short end and the long end basically at this level for the last 18 months give or take and the economy has had seven quarters of at or above potential growth okay well, that answers your question your basic question is are interest rates you know is this a roughly neutral interest rate or is this hmm. you know Uh, incredibly tight interest rate. And I don't think you'd get those empirical outcomes if it was actually an incredibly tight interest rate. So I think that empiric approach, I think, is the main way that you can understand whether money is tight or not. And then, of course, you start to think about it incrementally from there. And in particular, I think, start to think about what the term premium is. And that term premium, uh, you know, today is basically where it's been on average in the post-GFC period, which is about zero. And you can start to ask yourself, well, do the macro, the structural macroeconomic conditions, do they align with a term premium uh, that is consistent with what we've seen in the post-GFC deleveraging, or have the macroeconomic dynamics changed, you know, higher inflation pressures, better productivity, better, you know, better population growth, uh, more structural, you know, uh, demand for capital relative to supply, like all of those things point you in the direction of the fact that we should have a bit higher term premium than where we had before. But yet, you know, it hasn't yet moved because we've had those long only asset managers keep bidding every time you get an incrementally higher rate. Bob, if we if we're truly uh, to believe this reflation narrative and this commodity rally, we probably also need China to buy into it. Um, so what's your gut feeling on what's ongoing in China right here? It seems very tricky to gauge uh, as far as I am uh, able to, um, to to assess it from from the outside. But what's your take? I, I think it, I, I share with you uh. the, um, let's say, the uncertainty about uh. exactly what's going on. I think when I look at most of the data and most of the market action, it looks like not much has changed. Like, you know, I don't know, the PMIs are basically flat, like trade, you know, was a lot weaker last year and, you know, is kind of neutral this year in terms of the numbers that we're seeing. Um, the commodities that have the most China sensitivity, things like steel and iron ore, are basically plunging to, you know, post-COVID lows uh, and lows of almost the last 10 years. So you sort of add that all up and you, and, and I should say also Chinese bond yields continue to fall meaningfully. If you look at that sort of constellation of things, you'd sort of say, this doesn't really look like much is going on, combined with the fact that the equity market after that pop from the national team buying mm -hmm. has mostly been flat, right, over the course of the last couple of weeks. So all of those things, when you read the tea leaves, look like nothing's really happening nothing's really changing and you're not really getting China getting geared up in the commodity demand. And then of course you look at copper and it's surging through the roof and you're like, okay, <laughs> two, 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 two totally different stories that are going on there. Now, maybe those idiosyncratic things, you know, we were talking about a little, little bit of that mm. uh, in terms of the idiosyncratic things on copper. 
Um, but that's copper, I think, is more the outlier than it is consistent with lots of the other data points, at least I'm seeing it, Chuck. Mm. I would tend to agree with that. Um, but it's very, very tricky to figure it out um, on a running basis, also given the lack of transparency from uh, from the Chinese authorities. But final question I have for you uh, relates to Japan. Uh, they obviously moved the needle on the front end uh, of the yield curve. Um, and I guess it was the talk of the town a couple of weeks, uh, but nothing major happened, right? I, I, I mean, where does the... <laughs> Japanese outlook leave us from here in a global fixed income context. I mean, is it meaningful what is happening out there? Uh, I, I mean, I think the BOJ, uh, it's been, you know, I've been following the BOJ for, you know, 20 years. And uh, I think, you know, their interest rate policy has been uh, uh, essentially zero for 20 years. And tiny tweaks like what happened with the most recent announcement, while it sort of like makes good Twitter clickbait headlines of they're out of zero, you know, negative interest rates. Like it, it has essentially no functional impact on on uh, on markets or or the economy. I mean, basically, what's happening in Japan is, you know, money is very easy. The economy, you know, inflationary pressures are very contained. Most inflation that's occurring, basically all of it, is from imported inflation on that, um, and the economy is, you know puttering along, it's fine, it's not great. And so that's a that's a sort of um, set of conditions that would require continued easy monetary policy. There's no reason to tighten rapidly. Uh, and that's in the context of, you know, particularly in the US situation where, you know, you'd ex the overall set of conditions are strong and, uh, and uh, for economic conditions, inflation is starting to tick up. And if anything, you know, pushing to tighter than expected monetary policy. And so I think, that divergence there, it's not really going to be driven by what's going on in Japan. Nothing is going to happen meaningful. It's going to happen in Japan, you know, as far as the eye can see. And so really, like if you're trading the, the currency, let's say, it's mostly going to be a function of what goes on with U.S. monetary policy and dynamics, much more so than it is whatever the BOJ is going to do. Yeah. Let's <laughs> kick the can down the road in Japan again. <laughs> then, Bob, I think that's uh, uh, kind of the wise words we can conclude this interview with. It's always a pleasure to host you here at the Macro Sunday, Bob, and uh, we hope to have you back again soon. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. Back in the studio from the interview with Bob Elliott of Unlimited Funds. Go out. And check Unlimited Funds uh, if you haven't already done so. It's tremendous work that uh, Bob and his team is uh, putting in. Um, Miguel, what's left uh, today is to sort of discuss the bottom line of this geopolitical picture and the macro picture. Um, and we've taken a few decisions aimed at, I guess, partially reflation following up uh, on what we've already seen over the past couple of mm -hmm. months through April as well, and continued turbulence in geopolitics, at least no yeah. imminent peace deals, no imminent truce in the Red Sea. Um, so, I mean, Mikkel, just um, to elaborate on that before we get to the details of the portfolio, are we anywhere near some kind of completely stable scenario in the Middle East here? Um, no, I have to admit we aren't. Uh, yeah. As we mentioned a couple of times, I thought we were much closer to a truce. I still believe we're moving in that direction, but but Netanyahu seems hell-bent on destroying what was whatever's left of Hamas, whatever he can do. Um, whenever he's done with that, the one thing he will have destroyed is Israel supporting the West. Um, the Palestinians are uh, <clears throat> growing their support in the West as well as within the Middle East. Uh, the Israelis are losing support left, right and center, and that will create a more unstable environment over the coming years because the Palestinian question is back in Middle Eastern politics. Uh, oh. it, it's It's been f dropping down the uh, the importance list uh, or the, 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 the importance ranking of topics uh, in many countries. Uh, Countries have been focused on uh, trade, internal security, and make, building relations with Israel. That's off the table now for many of these countries, especially as, as Israel continues this, this campaign. So that leaves us with the Middle East that's back to the 70s very much, I believe. We're, 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 we're going to return to uh, animosity between Israel and, and, and even the larger uh, Arabic states. And we're, we're at a place where 
this this broad consensus based uh, triple alliance Egypt Israel Saudi is not going to happen right now so uh, we're looking at a very much refragmented middle east uh, which is um, yeah not good for oil prices if you want them to be lower anyway no uh, and remember those of you watching or listening to this show this is an analysis not an opinion absolutely uh, we had a lot of uh, <laughs> feedback saying that this was an- anti israel We're not anti-Israel. No, We're no, just no, trying no. To, to make an analysis out of the situation. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I just wanted to repeat that because mm-hmm. it's important for me to stress that I'm not uh, uh, against the state of Israel in any way. Mikkel, portfolio-wise, mm-hmm. um, I think this makes for an interesting short-term outlook. Um, our asset allocation tool is still very upbeat on the commodity space. Um, because of that underlying reflation pressure stemming from a lack of safe shipping lanes stemming from um, a demand increase in the manufacturing space with still contained supply side uh, dynamics especially given uh, mid- middle eastern wishes to keep the oil price at high levels into the election uh, later this year um, it also seems like russia is at least playing ball with that view for now. I mean, they've been <laughs> cheating a little bit on the OPEC plus group from time to time, but right now it seems like they're playing ball. Uh, also, as they're, as far as I'm concerned, Miguel, probably pretty content to, with what they're seeing in the Middle East absolutely, right now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so what I'm saying here is that we're leaning into the commodity space still. Uh, we've added a position in silver miners, the <laughs> ultimate FOMO trade out there. Um <laughs> It's probably the trade that is being discussed the most on a running basis in various Reddit for us and stuff like that. Um, but there is a decent probability of an outright melt-up uh, in the reflation theme short term because so many players are caught underweight uh, in this commodity space. Uh, and it seems like they're currently willing to chase up the price even though it's been out of whack with long-term fundamentals. Um, so. Yeah, silver miners. <laughs> um, we're in it um, with a fear of missing out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, you return to home turf, the Norwegian corner. Tell yeah. us about that. Uh, more or less well, home turf. More or less home turf. Um, well, uh, for those of you who who do not follow the Norwegian economy closely, uh, the Norwegian um, so-called money market expert committee uh, released their new suggestions on how to deal with the FX policy of the Norwegian Central Bank, uh, with the liquidity in the Norwegian money markets. And my best uh, sort of assessment after reading this report is that it will be positive for the net flow of the Norwegian krona, as it will allow them not to uh, fully sterilize the payments from oil companies in tax. Um, it will also increase the amount of structural liquidity in the Norwegian banking system. But if you want all the details on that, uh, standardresearch.com is the place to go. Uh, we we obviously have a very uh, solid uh, niche focus on Europe and, and Scandinavia, given our heritage. Just one last question. What about the Korea trade? Uh, yeah, we're still in it. Um, but I I have to agree, and I, I discussed it with Bob as well. I, I mean, it's it's a bit tricky to figure out whether China is actually rebounding or not. Yeah. Um, the obvious lack of transparency, uh, but but our now costs stuff that we can actually track without the fear of being manipulated. Um, they're doing okay. Uh, so for now, I mean, we're past the worst. And that's maybe newsworthy in itself. And Korea is a very decent proxy trade for China uh, without all of the political risks surrounding mainland China. And bear this in mind, Samsung, the flagship of the Korean equity market, is rebounding. Which will be a driver for the Korean bet, absolutely. That's it for this week. Yes. Uh, we'll be back next week with more. Uh, In the meantime, follow us on uh, stenrisha.com or at uh, at X or wherever we, we post. Yeah, thanks a lot for watching. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit.